Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you this morning. We pray the Lord's blessing be upon you today. Let's stand together. We're going to start out this morning with our song, Reach Out to Jesus. And I really love this song. This is, this is also a song that I like to kind of sing and pray through at the same time. And so it's a lovely song. Let's sing this one together as unto the Lord, all right? Is your burden heavy? As you bear it all alone, does the road you travel harbor dangers yet unknown? Are you ever weary in the struggle of it all? Jesus will. Amen. Brother John, would you open us in prayer, please? Father, thank you for the, the way that you love us. Yes. When we're unlovable sometimes. Mm. Thank you that we can reach out to you because you're always there. When we get discouraged, you're there. Amen. Thank you. And you may be seated. Another very familiar song and one I think that we should be about, we should be doing every day, and that is count your blessings. Amen. Let's sing this together. When upon life's billows you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. 
Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy? singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Okay, now on the last stand, of that last chorus, count your blessings, name them one by one. Instead of saying one by one, we are going to name them ton by ton. Yeah. All right? Amen? Let's Amen. give God all the glory for this one, right? Let's do this together. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be disheartened, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them time by time. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them time by time. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Somebody said to me, you know, ton by ton. I mean, has God blessed me that much? I said, if you only realize, do you know how many bacteria run on your body every day? Billions. And you know, God's working through that every day, ton by ton, keeping you alive. Amen? Amen. Let's thank him for that. Let's stand together to our feet. Psalm chapter 30 is our scripture for this morning's reading. Let's read this together. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. O Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now in my prosperity I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by your favor you have made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face and I was troubled. I cried out to you, O Lord, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing and have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. May the Lord add the blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Thank you, and you may be seated. Amen. All right, let's see. Um, you know what I forgot to have us do this morning was our little greeting wave to everybody. So how about just taking a look around and giving a greeting and say, good to see you, greetiers. And at this time, our junior church is dismissed with Mrs. Sargent. They can go down for junior church. Good to see all these kids. And as the kids are going down for junior church, Galileans are going to come and they're going to sing for us.
I was almost on my own this morning. Pam come in, and Pam looks at me, and she says, we're supposed to sing this morning? Obviously, I was not paying attention when I thought you got I was going to be on my own, and you know, you know how shy I am. Especially that last song. All by myself. All by myself. All right, everybody join in. Let me walk, blessed Lord, in the way that I've gone, leading straight to the land of all, giving cheer everywhere. Wrath and my soul satisfied Fill my way every day with love Fill my way every day with love As I walk with the heavenly dove Let me go all the while with a song in his mind Fill my way every day with love I like that country song. Soon the race will be over and I'll travel no more. But the vine in my home of all. Let me sing, blessed King, all the way through the door. Fill my way every day with love. Fill my way. As I walk with the heavenly dove, let me go all the while with a song and a smile. Fill my way every day with love. Once more, fill my way every day with love. As I walk with the heavenly dove, let me go all the while with a song and a smile. Fill my way. tell you <clears throat> this world is beyond crazy isn't it it's beyond crazy but you know something God can change it five minutes flat change the whole entire thing so keep focused not on the world but keep focused on God. Well, if we were too comfortable here, we wouldn't be looking forward to heaven. Exactly. And I'm not too comfortable at all. <laughs> well, we can't feel at home in this world anymore. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures and my hopes are all beyond the blue Where many Christian children have gone on before And I can't feel at home in this world anymore Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you If heaven's not my home, oh Lord, what could I do? The angels beckon me to heaven's open door And I can't feel at home in this world anymore They're all expecting me And that's one thing I know My Savior pardoned me And now I onward go I know He'll take me through the 
I am weak and poor And I can't feel at home in this world anymore Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you If heaven's not my home, oh Lord, what could I do? The angels beckon me to heaven's open door And I can't feel at home in this world anymore Over in the glory land there is no dying there The saints are shouting victory and singing everywhere I hear the voice of God that I have heard before And I can't feel at home in this world anymore Oh Lord, you know like you if heaven's not my home oh lord what could i do the angels beckon me to heaven's open door and i can't feel at home in this world anymore and i can't feel at home in this world anymore amen Thank you so much for that. If that doesn't bless your blesser, your blesser is broken. <laughs> Amen? Amen? All right. Well, listen, just before we make a few announcements, um, somebody turned in a ring last week. It, it looks kind of silver in color, and it's got a band that spins around the inside band. And if it belongs, it was found after the first service. So if it belongs to anybody, just see me afterward, and with this ring, I will not wed, but I will, <laughs> I will personally give it back to you, okay? So I'll have it up here if you think, hey, you know what? That was my ring. So you'll be able to get your ring back. All right. Uh, just a few announcements we want to make, and then Gadolene's going to come. They have one more special number. They're going to be singing for us, and I look forward to that. Wednesday at 7... We have our Bible study and prayer time, Guiding Principles for the Family and for Business. And we're going to be looking again, Colossians chapter 3, verse 18 through chapter 4, verse 1. Very interesting study. Love to have you here for it. Blast, Junior Travelers, and also Sunshine Bunch going on at that time. Thursday, 930, ladies, you know, that's the Gospel Project. They meet downstairs, and if you're not able to meet there downstairs in the Fellowship Hall on Thursday at 930, you can, in the comfort and privacy of your own home, get on the Zoom link, and you can meet from your home Thursday night at 6.30 for that same study. And if you don't have your book for that study, this new period they're going into, you can see Connie today. Right now, she's downstairs at the junior church. You can see her after service. Make your way down there. Say, I want to get on Zoom. I'd like to get a book, and she can set that all up for you. All right, I think that's all the announcements that we have, so let's pray together. Galileans are going to come and sing one more song, and then we're going to dive right into our scripture this morning. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, and Father, thank you for the songs that we've heard this morning. Uh, my spirit is so picked up through that music today because of the solid message that we find in those words. It's fun to sing. Lord, you love singing. Singing is going to be a big part of our heavenly experience. And we're going to have wonderful voices to be able to sing unto you. And that's part of the best part. Amen. 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 Father, as we're here right now, we ask that you would take our service and that you would bless it. And that you would do whatever needs to be done in our lives to help us to be more like your only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I do thank you for our tithes, offerings, mission support, Lord, uh, the meeting of our needs of this church for everyone who gives. Lord, we are so appreciative, and I pray that you'd bless them above blessing. We think of our missionaries, Lord, on the field and the needs that they have. Thank you for the continued faithful support for our missionaries, not only across the, across the ocean, around the world, but also some that we support in this country in the work that they do here. Lord, I ask and pray in a few minutes that we go into the scripture with you, Lord, that you would speak to our heart, that you would challenge us, and Lord, as always, and even as Brother John prayed already this morning, if there are any here 
that do not know Jesus Christ as personal Savior. They know all about him in their head. They can answer all the questions. But that long journey from head to heart, they've yet to make that. And so, Father, I pray that they would come to Christ today. And I pray for each of us who name the name of Christ. Lord, there's no more, I think, important time that the body of Christ gets serious about the faith that you've called them to. Even as Bernie pointed out to us this morning, this world is over the top more than crazy right now. And it's not getting better. And so, Lord, help us to stand. And having done all to stand, as Paul said, to stand for truth in you. Bless us this day. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, Galileans are going to come and sing another song for us. All right, we had some time trying to convince Bernie to do this song. <laughs> but when was this song written? Johnny Cash did this song. So obviously it wasn't just written, but boy, does it fit today. Right to the T. Now I'm going to be I'm going to be staring at this, and it's it's not my memory; it's my age. <laughs> okay, you all set. I'm good. All right. I might turn this.
I don't know if you've ever heard, uh, you know, several years ago, Johnny Cash did the, uh, a, a reading of the scripture. It was taped. You could buy the tapes. Johnny Cash reads the scripture. And he gets to a passage. He gets to the passage where Paul talks about our sin and says, and such were some of you. And he reads that thing flawlessly all the way through. And when he gets to that part, his voice cracks, it breaks, and you can just hear him knowing that that was me. Because he later on, he did come to faith in Christ. He married a preacher's daughter and came to faith in Christ. And so praise the Lord. Amen. That's, uh, that's what it's all about. We're grateful. Take your Bible, if you would, with me, please, and turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. I want to hone in on one verse out of 2 Peter chapter 3 this morning. We mentioned it to you last week, but we want to give it to maybe a little more direct, and we're going to be in two passages, especially this morning, that we're going to read together. The first one's going to be found here in 2 Peter chapter 3, and then we're going to have you turn over to another in the Gospel of Luke. But in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 9, the Bible says, The Lord is not slack. Concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but as long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen? Amen. Never bemoan God's long suffering toward the ungodly. Thank God for it. And let's thank God. For even when we test his loving patience, graciousness, and kindness, he's still long-suffering. So thank him for that. But there's so much in this that we see. God is not slack concerning his promise, as some of us would count that. He's not slow in giving us his promises, fulfillment, but he's long-suffering toward us. And I love this part of the scripture, and who you're going to hone here a little bit today. He says, not willing that... How many should perish? Not willing that any should perish, but that how many should come to repentance? But that all should come to repentance. Now, I'm so grateful that I moved from the any to the all. Aren't you glad about that for yourself? Now, I want to I speak to you this morning, but I'd like to focus our attention. If you take your Bible with me, Flip over to Luke's Gospel, Luke's Gospel, chapter number 16. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 16, and we're going to begin reading in verse number 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. So what do we know about this person? He was what? Number one, he was what? Rich. Rich. Uh, is God against rich people? No, no, this is not what it's about. It's not about the fact that he's rich, although the Bible points that out for us because we have to know about him. So something we know about him, he is rich, and then we see here, um, what's some of his fashion? The Bible says he's what? Clothed in purple and fine linen, and he, the Bible says, fared sumptuously which basically, in our modern-day vernacular, this guy lived in luxury, all right? Which none of that, listen, I have friends that are very well-to-do, and you know what? They dress well, they look well, they smell well, they, everything is well about them, and they live in the lap of luxury. And they love Jesus, and they're in their church today dressed like you are right now. They are. So, but that's not the issue, right? We're going to find out here. But then the Bible said there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores who was laid at his gate. Okay, who, what's the beggar? Who, what's his name? Lazarus. What do we know about Lazarus? Full of sores. First we know he's a beggar, right? He's not rich. He's not from that side of town. He's a beggar, and he, his name is Lazarus, and he is full of sores, and he's sitting outside in somebody's borrowed Maserati, Right? Not at all. He's not even in a hay bale wagon. Okay? It just says here that he is laid at his gate. At the gate. Whose gate? The rich man's gate. He's laid outside the rich man's gate. 
desiring to be fed with the crumbs, verse 21, or what fell from the whose table? The rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Lots of fun, right? Something we would really want to partake in. Probably not. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. Now, who's Abraham? Abraham is a patriarch that we see in the Older Testament. Abraham was one who was known as the what of God? He was known as the friend of God, right? He had faith in God, trust in God. It was Abraham when, when he was told, take your son up to the mountain, you're going to sacrifice him. And the angel said, Abraham, Abraham, don't do any harm to your son, right? God has provided himself a lamb. So Abraham's got this wonderful relationship with Almighty God. He's known as a friend of God. It was Abraham we looked at whose nephew Lot decided to go into Sodom. Sodom got into him. And Abraham went to bat for his nephew with God and said, God, if there's 50 righteous, will you spare the city? Took him all the way down to how many? I think it was 10, right? This is how much he cared for his nephew, going to bat before God with him, okay? So here, the Bible tells us that the beggar dies and he's carried by the angels. So if you're carried by the angels, uh, destination what? Heaven. It wasn't, it's not saying he was swept down with the demons. He's carried by the angels, right, to that place they call Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died. So we got two men, rich man, poor man. One fair, sumptuously, lap of luxury. The poor man, not so good. He's, he's begging. He's full of sores. He's laying at the gate. All he wants is crumbs. He's not looking for the whole steak. He's looking for a little gristle. That's all he wants, right, to get him by in his day. And they both die. The beggar dies. The rich man dies also. But the Bible says while the beggar is carried to Abraham's bosom, the rich man also died and simply says this, was buried. Was buried. Body back to the earth. And being now, it gives us a little more insight. And being in torments, this is making reference to the rich man, being in torments in hell, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom, which the Bible already points out to us. Then he cries and says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember... That in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fix so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Oh, and by the way, what's he, what's he actually saying here? He's saying to him, they have the gospel of Christ. Let them hear that. Study out Moses and the prophets following after God. What were they all about? Directing people to who? God. In the New Old Testament, they looked forward to what God was going to do. Now we, being all that past, we look back at what God has already done. So he basically says to them, they have the gospel. Let them hear it. And he says, no, Father Abraham. But if one goes to them from the dead... They will repent. Guess what happened in the gospel story? One went to them from the dead. His name is Jesus. Abraham said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. As we read in our text, it's not God's will. It's not God's desire for anyone to perish and spend eternity in a place called hell. In fact, Jesus lets us know in through 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul writes of Jesus in verses 4 through 6. He said of Jesus who desires all men to be saved. 
and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God. There is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all. So when people say to you, hey, there are many gods, people can get to heaven any old way they want. Or when people come to you and say, hey, listen, you got this group, this group, this group, group, this group, but we all serve the same God. Not true. Not true. If that God's name is any other name than Jesus, You say, oh, man, that sounds awfully exclusive. And I'm going to say, you are awfully correct. (laughs) But I'm also going to remind you of this. In the love of God, it's all inclusive. It's the whosoever will may come. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, the Bible says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was Lost. That's the amazing grace story, isn't it? I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. The question has been asked, is there life after this life? And if so, do some people go to hell? How, how, would, you, how would you answer that question for people? Okay. So let's scratch into it a little bit deeper than just a yes, let's give you some teeth to your yes. Because that answer is found in God's word, and that's where we're going today. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, I'm going to try to talk slow if you promise to write fast, if you're taking notes. I'm going to try to talk slow. Then I saw a great white throne, and him, capital H, who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Interesting. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, can you define the term anyone? Anyone. Anyone. I think we all know what that means. Anyone want ice cream? The whole crowd runs <laughs> to you. They get it. They don't stop and say, well, what, what, is, what do they mean? Anyone. No, you jump on it. Boom, there you go. You got your ice cream, right? Matthew 25, 46 says, and these will go away into eternal punishment. Now, though there are few messages preached concerning hell today, It doesn't change the truth. It doesn't change the fact that the Bible is true, that there is a hell, and people who die without faith in Christ go there. We just read an account in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 26. The rich man and Lazarus. So then why did the rich man go to hell? Well, look at that. The three P's I want to throw out to you this morning to help me memorize and help you to remember in our account in Luke 16, and the first one is the place. 
the place. Now, the Bible, I believe here, is talking about a literal place. Some people say, well, this was you know, parable or this was some story, this was some account, not really true, it's made for illustration. No, there's real names mentioned here. I believe real names, I also believe real place. The man in this passage, I want to point out to you, this individual in this real place, this literal place, the man in this passage could see. This wasn't a dream. This wasn't some sequence of event going on in his mind while he's sleeping, and he wakes up in a cold sweat. Wow, what was that? Hmm. No, this man in this passage could see. This man in this passage could feel. This man in this passage could hear. And this man in this passage could talk. He could speak. So it's a literal place we're talking about. It's a literal place that Jesus is making reference to. Secondly, it's not only a literal place, but I believe the Bible teaches it is a large place. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, the Bible says, For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Why is it a need to be the wide gate, the broad way? Because there are many that go in there at. It's a large place. People without Christ. It's also a loud place. The Bible makes reference to the constant weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's also a lonesome place. You know, I, I don't know how many people over my years of being a, a pastor, and even before I was a pastor, when I first came to faith in Christ, one of the great burdens of my heart were my friends. My best friend lived next door. Man, I don't want him to die and go to hell. My girlfriend I was dating at the time, I don't want her to die and go to hell. I, I just, I was a telling machine. I wanted to tell. Now, I, I didn't always have it. I, I wasn't always smooth. I wasn't always suave like I am today. <laughs> now, I'm still not smooth and suave. But it just blurred out of me. Hey, you don't, you don't come to Christ. You're dying and going to hell. You need to come to Christ. Whoa, whoa, slow down. Bob, what's this all about? But, oh, I so cared about. And, and I'd, I'd talk to some friends and some people, and they'd say, no, I don't need Jesus. In fact, if I go to hell, that's fine. All my friends are going to be there. You know what? It's not going to be the party place. And I would find myself as a teenager in my late teens weeping over friends who just had this attitude that I'm going to be there with all my best buds. No, you're not. Not the way you think. That's a lie straight from the devil. There's a place. There is what I call, secondly, the portrait. Consider the rich man's dying moment in this portrait. Verse 22, we read it. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Listen, here, here's, here's the, the canvas that we're going to paint out, right? Neither wealth nor poverty secures one from death. Yet there's so many people that live that way. If I have money, I don't need anything else. You know, you ever hear the expression, to you know where with your money? Because that's where they're going to go with it if they don't know Christ. Death is the common end to all classes of humankind. Death is no respect of person. Death doesn't say, oh, you've got money, I'm hands off. Oh, you're poor, oh, I got you. Or uh, the other way around. Death doesn't say, you come from an upstanding family, I'm going to leave you alone. Death doesn't look at you and say, oh, you come from a not so great neighborhood, I'm coming into your neighborhood. No, death is no respect of person. And if you think about it, you know that all of us have been more, to more than one funeral. And we've seen all kinds of people in those caskets. And we've seen all types of ages of people in those caskets. We've had them here. We've had them out there. 
Yet most today live their life as if they're going to live, what's the word? Forever. There's only one group of people that I know as I read the Bible and study the Bible that's going to live forever one day in eternity, and those are believers. Everybody else, no. Consider the misery described here. It says, in being in torments in hell, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip. Now get this. To me, this is one of the saddest passages in Scripture for the individual. Send Lazarus, who's in Abraham's bosom, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, I'd like you to do something sometime. You got your little beverage. Don't, don't have somebody else stick their finger in your water, but you do your own. Take your finger, stick it in the water, pull it up, and get one drop off it, and then let go. That's all he's praying for. That's all he's begging for. One single drop. In the water, up, one drip, gone. That's all he wants. And why does he want that? Because he's not in the party place. He's not in the place where the drinks are being passed around. He's not in the place that, that the air conditioning's going. He's not in the place where the fancy music is playing. And, and, and there's the dining room with all the best of foods. He says, I have him come dip the tip of his finger in water, cool my tongue. Why? For I am tormented in this flame. Have you ever been tormented? I mean, it's no secret. I've had my share of surgeries with doctors over the years. And I can't say that I've ever really been tormented except maybe one time with a needle. I, I, I hate needles. And when they come with a needle that's as big as you, you go, wah! And the torment begins, right? And they say, oh, don't be such a baby. A baby? I want to say, let me use it on you first, and then me, right? Torment. I went to a place the other day, and I was looking at some home safety stuff, alarm stuff, and all this other stuff that you can get. And I picked up on the counter, there was a flashlight. And it's, a, it's a good size, so it's about like this. It's got the round black handle, a bulbous head, and it's a light. And I picked that light up, and I, I, put that, I put that light on, you know, I look, and it's got a one, and I said, boy, I have one of these. And the fellow looks at me and says, I don't think you do. And I said, what do you mean? He says, push it up again. I pushed the button up again, and there was a little red light on the side that glistened. And I said, what does that mean? He said, you're holding a flashlight, but it's a stun gun light. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so then he says to me, have you ever been stunned by a stun gun? I says, no. I said, is it, is it pretty powerful? He says, give it to me. He says, come here. <laughs> I said, mama didn't raise no fool. He said, no, no. He said, it's instantaneous. But he said, if I touch you, you just jerk away. You don't have to, don't stand there and say, oh, tough it up. He said, jerk away. I said, nah, I can't do that. He said, come on. He said, we, we practice this in safety courses. Try it. I said, all right. <laughs> He put that thing on, and he, right here, he jacked me with that thing. Do you know that's still humming? <laughs> he touched me with that, and I went, whoa! I backed right away. That's the closest thing to torment. I can't imagine getting in a tussle with somebody, and you have that thing, and you keep that into their flesh. He told me there's not a human being on planet Earth that can continue to take that. There's no way. There is absolutely no way. And I said, well, good, because I'm not taking it. Torment. Hell is a place of punishment and not a place of party. You know what? We don't have time to go through all these scriptures with you this morning, but I'm going to read. I want to share with you. I'm, I'm, I looked at all these scriptures. I'm going to give you a heading. I'm going to give you the reference. If, if you are taking a note, you can write this down. There, there's, there's several of them. Hell is a place of punishment, a lake of fire. 
Revelation 2015. Or you can just write down the reference and look it up yourself. I, I encourage you to look it up. Hell's a place, it's a lake of fire, Revelation 2015. It's a bottomless pit, Revelation 20, verse 1. It's a horrible tempest, Psalm 11, verse 6. Hell is a devouring fire, Isaiah 33, 14. Hell is a place of sorrows, Psalm 18, 5. Hell is a place of weeping, Matthew 8, 12. Hell is a furnace of fire, Matthew 13, 41 and 42, the verses. Hell is a place of torments, our text, Luke 16, 23. Hell is a place of filthiness, Revelation 22, 10 and 11, the verses. Hell is a place of cursing God, Revelation 16, 11. Hell is a place of everlasting burnings. Isaiah 33, 14. A few more. Hell is a place of everlasting punishment. Matthew 25, 46. Hell is a place of darkness. Matthew 25, 30. Hell is a place of no rest. Luke 16, 27. Hell is a place of screams for mercy. Luke 16, 24. Last one. Hell is a place of gnawing the tongue, Revelation 16, 10. Now, to sum all that up, I would say to you, based on the scriptures, that hell is a place where Jesus does not want you to go. Why? Why do I make that statement? Because hell is a place of insufferable pain. Hell is a place of anguish, insufferable pain, and anguish. Harry Salzman, an evangelist, we had him here at our church several years ago. Harry Salzman was a fella who had his eyesight. He had, I mean, he could, he could take a needle and thread a needle, arms fully extended. He'd hit that every time. Never have a problem. Harry Salzman developed some diabetic condition. He started losing his sight. He had special lenses put in. He wore Coke bottle lenses that were as thick as could be on his glasses. We had Brother Harry here a couple of times in the early days of my ministry here. Harry is now with the Lord. He was from northern Michigan. Harry was a man on the run from God. He was a man on the run from God. He moved up to northern Michigan to get as far away from God as he could possibly get. And when he got up to the crown of Michigan, he thought, aha, deep snow, freezing cold, nobody's going to want to come find me. And one day, one day after several months of living there, he got a, a knock on the door, and who showed up? He said he looked like the Eskimo king, but he was a Baptist minister from a church two towns away that heard about this fellow who was on the run from God. Who put that evangelist, who put, who put that fellow after him? Almighty God, right? It's interesting, part of Harry's testimony is he used to race cars when he had his sight, when he had his vision better. He used to race cars, and he had a friend named Rusty that raced cars. And one day they were in a practice meet, and as they were doing the practice meet, Rusty took the corner a little too fast. The car went up in the air, spun out of control, crashed on the wall, and then came out and burst into flames. Harry said he pulled his car over. The, the people came out of the pit. They came running to the car. Harry got out of his car, and he went running after his friend, and he said, Have you ever watched a human being burn up in a fire? 
He said it was the most horrible thing he's ever seen in his life. The smell, the screams, the contorting, the literal visible melting of that body in front of your eyes. Harry said that's the closest thing that God ever gave to him pertaining to a vision of hell and the insurmountable, insufferable pain and intolerable anguish that one feels. And I never forgot that. I never forgot that story. Listen, consider the desired mercy. Verse 24 in Luke 16, the Bible said, Then he cried, that's the beggar, he cries and says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, that again, that he may dip the tip of his finger and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Again, I want you to think about this. A moment ago, I said, take your finger, put it in a cup, pull it up. But, but I really want you to consider this. Have you ever been so thirsty that you could have drank a lake? <laughs> You're working outside summertime, cutting grass, going for a hike, doing something, mountain climbing, scaling this, doing that. You're, you are so thirsty. You're like, now, I come to you and I say, here you go. Oh, you got something to drink? Yeah. And I pull out an eyedropper and I say, open up. <laughs> One drop. I know what you're going to say. Man, that was refreshing. Yeah. I'm good to go. No, I don't think so. I think you're going to nail me for kind of tantalizing your taste buds and not meeting that need, right? Here's consider the desired mercy that this fellow wanted when he says, Father Abraham, send him to give me a simple drop. Question. Did the mercy ever come? Did the drop ever come? No. No. So when your friend says to you, oh, you may be going on your way to heaven, but I'm going to go to hell, and you know, I'll be fine. No, you won't. You won't. Not in the least. Consider the disturbing memory. But Abraham said, son, remember, God gives us a memory, doesn't he? He gives us a memory. He says, son, remember that in your lifetime you received the good things. Likewise, Lazarus, the evil things. You know what he gets to remember? He gets to remember how well Lazarus is comforted and how much he's tormented. Consider the deadly mistake he makes. He says, no, Father Abraham, but if he goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Well, wait a minute. He disbelieved too often, and now he's believing this too late. Because let me ask you, when is the opportune time for a person to trust Christ? Paul said, behold, now is accepted time. Now is the day. Today's the day of salvation. This rich man, we can make the argument with you when he calls upon Abraham and says, look, if, if you'll send them to, to share the gospel, they will repent. No, wait a minute. This rich man, he disbelieved too often, believed too late. He disregarded too often, he believed too late. He despised too often, he believed too late. He disobeyed too often, and he, again, believed too late. So what's the divine message? I beg you for my brothers. I beg you. They will listen. The truth of the matter is, in this lifetime, God has given all the warning that's needed. Amen? God gives all the warning that's needed. So if we have the place and we have the portrait then we need to follow that up with the population. What do you mean? Well, the population, I mean this, many will be in hell. And that's a terrible thing to think about. Because we want to think the other way. We want to think, listen, because Jesus died on the cross for our sin, many will be in heaven. 
Bible teaches us about the many who'll be in hell. Matthew 7, 13, and 14, again, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Matthew 7, 22, and 23, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, Jesus said, I never knew you, Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. What does that verse say to you? I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I read that verse, and I'm about to tell you something's going to shock you. Sometimes I read that verse, that verse scares me to death. Because I have family, I have friends, I have you. You have me, we have one another that I think about all the time. Many will say, have we not prophesied? Have we not preached in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done many wonders in your name? And Jesus said, depart from me, I never knew you. Listen, you who practice lawlessness. So what is that all about? Well, let's look at the list of those who make up this place called hell. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 12 says, Do you not know? Now listen to this. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Question. Have you ever done anything that's unrighteous? Question. Do you continue to do anything that's unrighteous? You say, but that's under the blood of Jesus. For those who come to know Jesus Christ as personal Savior, who trust him for all that he is, who take him for all that he gives, you say, preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying to you that our relationship to Christ had better be more than fire insurance. There better be some life in that relationship. What makes you different than the unsaved world? Because I know a lot of unsaved world people, they are kind and they are gracious and they will help and they will do and they are wonderful. You say, well, you just described me. Yeah, and they don't know Christ. Do you? Do you? Or is it just your premium that you carry around with you? I call it fire insurance. You say, preacher, why you say this? Listen, do, no, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? That's a question. And then God says, do not be deceived. And that's what gets you. Because those already said to Jesus, didn't we do this? Didn't we do this? Didn't we do this? Jesus said, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Depart from me. I don't know who you are. That's the fire insurance crowd. That's the people that say it with their lips, but in their heart, they're far removed from him. They do the right things. They say the right things. They come to church. They sit in the pew. But that's all they are before God. It doesn't translate into a relationship with Christ Monday through Saturday. And this is where God says, do not be deceived. And listen to this list. He said, neither fornicators nor idolaters. Now, wait a minute. He said, well, I'm not a fornicator. Praise the Lord. Thank God. Are you an idolater? I didn't say adulterer, although that's next on the list. But are you an idolater? We had our men's class yesterday. Our men's group met. Grace and Granite. Uh, one of the things... The idolatries of the heart, Ezekiel 14 talks about. And what is the base definition of idolatry? It is anything, anything, anything that you place before God. Anything. So husband, if you place your wife before God, you're an idolater. 
And wives, if you place your husband before God and your relationship to God, you're an idolater. And if we place our children before God, our relationship to him, we're idolaters. If I place my grandchildren before God, I'm an idolater. If I place my workplace before God, I'm an idolater. Should I keep going in the list? Do you get it? Now, wait a minute. God said, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators nor idolaters. You ever hear the expression, keep short accounts? That's why. Well, preacher, it sounds like we, we have to be perfect. No, a thousand times no. You can't be perfect. We still have this old nature in us. And while the new nature before God, where the Spirit of God has moved in, that new nature spins us up to God all the time. But the old nature continues to spin you down. Continues to pull you away from God. Continues to pull you away from living for God, for serving God. Continues to pull your gifts away from God, your talents, your abilities, anything that God wants to use you as a child of God to edify the body of Christ. You could be a letter writer. You say, I enjoy writing letters. And write letters for God. Nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous. Wow. There we go. Uh-oh. I saw a 2021 Chevy Silverado the other day. I thought, whoa, buddy. God forgive me. Right? For drooling over that hunk of metal. <laughs> you say, ah, it kind of borders on silliness, uh huh? And then bordering on silliness too long ends up leading to the real thing. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit. The kingdom of God. And Paul writes, and such were some of you, but you were washed, praise the Lord. You were sanctified, set apart unto God, praise the Lord. You were justified, just as if you've never sinned, in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful, Paul said, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but, Paul said, I will not be brought under the power of any. And that's where that wheel hits the road. Because Paul goes on later to write the church at Galatia. And in Galatia chapter 5, beginning in verse 19, Paul makes reference to the works of the flesh that are evident, which he starts off with adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dis dissensions, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you before, just as I've told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Difference there. But you see what's in the list? Let's take some of the easier ones. The idolatry, the hatred, jealousies, outbursts of wrath. Selfish ambitions. Some of those. Now, sometimes these things creep up in our life. Yes? Yep. That's because we're not perfect. Imperfect people seeking to serve a perfect God. And sometimes these things creep up in our lives. And that's why that 1 John 1, 9 is there. We say if we confess our sin, for his, forsake our sin, God is faithful and just to cleanse us from all our sin and unrighteousness. But Paul makes mention here that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And that's key right here. This is not just one. I've come to Christ and once in a while I blow it. God forgive me. Put me back on the straight and narrow. This is somebody saying, oh, I've made a profession of Christ. But their life, there's been no change in their life. They continue to practice the old lifestyle, the old mannerism. Everything about the old man is still evident in them, even though their lips are telling us, I've trusted Jesus. Paul said, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. 
And if you're not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven, then where are you going? There's no holding tank here. There's no spot that you're going to, you, you weren't quite good enough for heaven, and, and you don't think you're bad enough to go to eternally separated from God in a place called hell, so we're going to put you in this holding tank, and if enough people pray for you, then through our prayers, you will go from the tank to home. It's not going to happen. The Bible speaks nothing about holding tank. The Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. Today's the day of salvation. And, and if you leave this place or any place that preaches the Bible, any place that cares about the souls of men, any church that's concerned about you, if you leave without knowing Jesus Christ, it, it, it's, it's, it, it, you see what he's doing? Because none of us knows how many days we have on planet Earth. None of us knows how long we're going to live before God says it's time. God goes on in Revelation 21, 8, says the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We don't, folks, listen, we don't like to look at those lists because they turn our stomach they make us weep. They make us grieve because we know family and we know friends that left this earth without ever putting faith and trust in Jesus and our hearts are broken and they should be. But let's not make the same things, that, the same mistakes that they made and let's not pass those mistakes on to our children and our grandchildren for them to make. You say, well, you're saying my relative didn't know Christ. I'm saying there's always hope. Hold out to hope. If they ever heard the message of the gospel, if they ever heard the name of Jesus, if they ever had a gospel track handed to them, let's hold out for hope. But you're never going to know until you get there yourself for those that are already gone. And I'm not going to give you false hope but I'm going to say, hold out for hope. Hope thou in God. We have a God of hope. So let me just wrap up a few more minutes of time. Let me wrap this up here. There's a question that's often asked, and I want to bring this in now because it, it gets to me, and, and that's this. How is an eternity in hell a just punishment for only a human lifetime of sin? Do you ever think about that? Do you ever do your study and let your mind really go into that? The answer, the Bible says that hell is eternal. Matthew chapter 25, verse 46. And many people struggle with the justice of that. They question, how is it just for God to punish a person for eternity in response to only a human lifetime of sin? From age 20 up. 70 years, 80 years, 90 years, 100 years. How does a sinner's finite lifespan merit an infinitely long punishment. Two principles. I share this with you. Two principles. The Bible declares that all sin is ultimately against God. All sin. Psalm 51, David prayed, Psalm 51, 4, against you, you only have I sinned. The extent of the punishment depends in part on the target of the crime. Who's the, who's the target of sin? Almighty God. In a human court of law, and for you legal minds, if I have this inaccurate, stand up and say, you are not right. But in a human court of law, a physical assault against an individual will usually result either in a fine or possibly some jail time. You're a legal person, you agree with that? Give me a head rattle. I'm looking. I'm looking. Anybody rattling your head? I go on. In contrast, a physical assault against the president or a prime minister of a country will likely result in a lifetime in prison. This is the case despite the fact that the crime was a one-time offense not a continually ongoing action. God is infinitely higher and greater 
than any human being that ever graced the planet. How much more are our crimes worthy of a greater punishment in the fact that our sins are against a holy and just God? Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is what? Secondly, the idea that we cease sinning after death is not taught in the Bible. This is another question. Are those who go to hell suddenly sinless and perfect? The answer to that is an emphatic no. Those who go into eternity without Christ will be confirmed in their sin. Okay, preacher, what do you mean? The hard-hearted on earth will be eternally hard-hearted in hell. You follow me? In hell there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. We've established Matthew 25, 30. But in hell there is no opportunity for repentance. The opportunity, friend, for repentance is right now. It's today. It's here. While you are living bodily in the flesh, here, body, soul, and spirit, we have opportunity to repent today. Those in hell will be given over to their own nature. They will be sin-infected. They will be evil, immoral, depraved individuals for all eternity. They will be forever unredeemed and forever unregenerate. The lake of fire will be a place of eternal rebellion against God, even as that rebellion is judged. Now, the Bible says in Revelation 20, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And those whose names are not found written in the book of life, remember, born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. Unsaved people do not only sin during their years while on earth, but they will sin in eternity. So it comes down to this. All of this that we've said today, let's boil it all down to these last few statements. It comes down to this. If a person wants to be separated from God for eternity, God will grant them their desire. He'll give it to them. He'll allow them to have it. Believers are those who say to God, your will be done. Unbelievers are those to whom God says to them, your will be done. Remember, it is not God's will that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. So the will of the unsaved is to reject salvation offered through Jesus Christ and remain in their sin. God will honor that decision along with its consequence for eternity. So the rich man in our passage, what was the issue? It wasn't because he was wealthy. It wasn't because he was rich. That wasn't it. it. wasn't because Lazarus was poor and without. The rich man in our passage had determined his own destiny by leaving God out of his life. No place for God. And now neither his character nor his destiny could be changed. For him, it was too late. So today, today, have you, in response to the word of God by faith, trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? If you have, say amen. amen. Do you know for certain beyond all doubt that Jesus died on the cross for you, paid for your sin debt with his own life, rose from the dead, defeating both death and the grave, that you might have everlasting life in a place called heaven? If you know this, say amen. amen. And we can say amen on the basis of Acts 4.12, which says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given amongst men, whereby we must be saved. We can say amen on the basis of John 3.3, 3, when Jesus said, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Some of you looking at me when I say born once, die twice, born twice, die once. Some look at me like born twice. What does that mean? Jesus said it here. It's called being born again, born from above, born of the Spirit. Salvation. 
So friend, when you say no to God, you are saying no to the only one who is able to make it possible for you to be birthed to eternal life. And Christian, I'm not going to leave you out. God does not want your divided attention. He wants your devotion. And I really think when we talk about, and the Bible talks about one day, a separation of wheat and tares, that's what it's going to come down to. Who was divided? Who had one foot in the world and one foot in him? Because the one foot you have in him, if you have it in the world, beloved, it's not truly in him. He doesn't want your divided attention. He wants you to be devoted to him. Because, beloved, he has been from eternity past through eternity present and eternity future completely and totally devoted to you. So when you say yes to God, you are saying yes to the creator. When you say yes to God, you are saying yes to the savior. When you say yes to God, you are saying yes to the sustainer of life, both now and for all time. And he is worthy. He is worthy of all honor. He is worthy of all glory. He is worthy of all praise. So I'm going to say it like this. It's never too late until it is. And if you don't know Jesus, trust him today. Give him your heart. Trust him for a home in heaven because he died for you. Conquered death in the grave for you. If you're a Christian, devote yourself to him today. Live for him today. Listen, friend, I'm telling you what, you'll never be sorry you did. And you have a chance to do it now. Do you get what we're saying? I love you. I want to see God do something great in you. In each of us who name the name of Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for this opportunity. And Lord, I know we, we went so far over today in our time. There's so much stuff we needed to share. God, the reality of heaven is real, but so is the reality of hell. And I get burdened. I get so burdened for those who say, I know Jesus. I've trusted Jesus. But the divided heart, rather than the devoted heart, It's going to cause many to wake up on that day and wonder what happened. Lord, let it not happen to anybody here. Let us all be raptured together. Let us all rejoice together because we've trusted you. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You say, Preacher, I'm not sure if I still believe everything you say. That's fine. But I challenge you to get into the Bible and start believing everything God says straight from his book. I promise you we're not seeking to lead you astray in any way, shape, or form. We don't want the judgment of God upon ourselves, upon me. But I want the blessings of God upon you. And that can only happen when you come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so today, if you say, Preacher, I've never trusted Christ as my Savior, will you pray for me? Anybody like that this morning with heads bowed, eyes closed, can I pray for you? Just slip your hand up. I don't want to go to hell, Preacher. I want to go to heaven. And by the way, let me tell you something. Listen, in my voice, you're not going to go to heaven because dad's going to heaven or mom's going to heaven or your siblings are going to heaven. We're all going to stand independently before God. You're going to go to heaven because you trusted Christ. You're going to go to hell because you rejected Christ. Nobody can make you go to heaven any more than anybody can make you go to hell. You 
have to make the decision for yourself. Preacher, pray for me. Anybody like that this morning? Just slip it up, put it down. Can I pray? Christian? Divided or devoted? Who are you? It's my prayer that you'll live for God all the days of your life. However many they may be. 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. That's nothing compared to eternity with God. So live from today, please. Live from today. And that's my prayer for all of us. Father, thank you for this opportunity we have to be with you today, to meet here today. Thank you for these that have come. Pray your blessing be upon us. And again, Lord, I know we went over in our time, but we just felt it so needful today because we care. If people know the truth, because it's that truth that will set them free. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. For his sake we pray. Amen. We pray God's bless you and you have a good